Hi, I'm your host Eudoria, and today we bring you the Matrix Expert webinar to provide you with expert advice and tips to help you stay on top of your study goals. Before we begin, let's meet today's expert. For this webinar, we recommend you have a pen and paper on hand to jot down our tips. Now that you're ready, let's get into the webinar. Hi everyone, welcome to the Matrix webinars. My name is Deborah Prospero and I've been tutoring and teaching English at Matrix Education and elsewhere for over four years. Having seen a lot of student work from all backgrounds and writing capabilities, today I'm really keen to share tips, tricks, and helpful approaches to creative and imaginative writing that will help cement your distinct written voice and set you apart from the average student. If this webinar is something that interests you, make sure to like and subscribe for more relevant content and resources that will help you get ahead and stay ahead of your high school studies. In terms of creative writing, a couple of problems and questions that we need to address before we get started might include, what is creative writing? Why do we do creative writing in English? How can I make creative writing effective and purposeful? How can I improve my use of creating writing techniques and my written expression? How can I engage with different types of writing styles and forms? And how can I best incorporate a stimulus, especially when it's an unseen assessment? What common mistakes can I avoid as well? Unpacking these questions points us to, e to these seven areas or chapters to consider. So our first chapter will be engaging with our imagination. Our second will be interpreting the stimulus, then understanding narrative elements, understanding textual form, language skills and written expression, mistakes to avoid, and finally, we'll talk about further reading tools that can help. So let's get into it. Chapter one, engaging with our imagination. To begin, let's chat about what creative writing is. Creative writing is essentially the creation of any writing, which, yes, can also mean that the academic essay writing that you're used to doing at school can be considered a form of writing creatively. But when we talk about creative writing as a term, we are actually referring to narrative writing or the act of fictional storytelling. In order to tell a compelling story, the general advice is usually to write about what you know. While this might be an important tip to keep in mind because of the power of our lived experiences, we also need to engage with ideas, topics, and themes that extend past the scope of what we have experienced as individuals, especially as high school students. Actually, the best way to construct a solid foundation for storytelling is to read stories. In saying that, being widely read is a long-term task that can seem pretty daunting, and many students complain that they don't have enough time in their busy schedules to read. If you can relate to the pressures of a busy timetable, try kicking off a good reading habit with flash fiction, short stories, and novellas that you can check out um, on our blog article. It's called The Short Story Reading Guide if you're looking for any suggestions. In trying to engage with our creative side, many of us might feel a mental block. Sometimes it can be helpful to think about what you're passionate about. Maybe you could write a story in which the protagonist is on the swim team or play soccer, just like you. It can also be helpful to think about what social issues matter to you. Do you want the underlying message of your story to share your experience as a young person in our diverse society? At other times, however, the best way to kickstart a creative story is through a writing prompt. A writing prompt can take the form of a quote, an image, an audio recording, or even a multimedia clip. And in our Nessa English syllabus, a writing prompt can be known as a stimulus. In fact, you might find that most creative assessments that you encounter in English will actually expect you to imaginatively respond to a stimulus. Chapter two, interpreting stimulus. And that leads to part two of our creative writing considerations. What is a stimulus and how can we interpret stimuli as writing prompts and skillfully incorporate them into our short narratives? Well, firstly, we need to understand that the form of the stimulus can impact the way we're gonna interpret it. We'll respond differently to an image than a quote or a lyricless audio recording. Before you put pen to paper, you need to think about how you will work the stimulus into your story. And a few helpful questions to ask yourself are actually, number one, what ideas, concepts, or themes does the stimulus contain or represent? What genre of story writing is the stimulus pushing you towards? What setting or perspective will you be taking? 
if you have a visual stimulus, you will take the image at face value um, and incorporate that visual scene as a moment in time of your story's plot. That's a possibility too. Will you be incorporating a symbol from within the stimulus as the overarching message of your story? That's more like a motif. Now, let's break down these questions by looking at a couple of examples. Our first example is an image, this image right here. On first glance, we can see that this is a picture of what used to be maybe a creek or a stream, but it's now all dried up. The two small boats, colloquially we can call them tinnies, have been stranded as the water has dried out. We can also see hints of trees and shrubbery poking through at the water's edge, which we can take to mean that the creek bread is still healthy. So perhaps the stream is experiencing a sort of seasonal dryness. With our little analysis, we can infer that it's the height of a dry season without rain. Perhaps we're experiencing a period of drought here. Now, of course, we can incorporate these literal elements of the image into any story. For example, I, it could be a story that takes place in a rural setting of a fishing town with a community that relies on water for its economy. This story could perhaps also play with form in being a series of episodes of the same drought situation, but with each paragraph from different perspectives of maybe various members of the community. This story could send a message of community resilience and support despite the adversity presented by Mother Nature. If we analyze the photo's visual elements, we can see that the colors present are brown, earthy tones with an even darker shadow casting its shade across the bottom left-hand corner. These colors might allude to the important role of nature having an on and off season, which is what causes periods of drought, but also periods of flooding. For a more abstract, surreal interpretation of the stimulus, perhaps you could write from the perspective of Mother Earth and the up and down life experiences that this personification of nature has on this particular creek. That would be a more elevated approach. Other story ideas that incorporate a metaphorical reading of the image could include looking at the symbolism of the bright green shrubbery poking through the top right corner. You could write about ideas of hope and optimism in times of emotional dryness. Finally, the symbolism of the boats being stranded on the dry creek bed. You could draw a figurative connection to the phrase of being left out to dry. Being left out to dry means to be abandoned during a sticky or particularly unpleasant situation. Can you think of a time when you've been abandoned by someone even when they've needed help? These are ways we can approach that stimulus. Our second stimulus is an audio recording of a train station, Sounds of Gare de l'Est of Paris. Now, let's take a quick listen to this audio recording of the ambience at a train station. The title of the recording gives us a clue that we are listening to random commuters' conversations that are taking place at a busy Parisian metropolitan station as trains pull in and out. As the actual recording is in a different language, we won't be able to understand what they're saying, but that also leaves the tone, mood, atmosphere, and of course, subject matter open to interpretation. The conversation is clearly light in tone with the commuters engaging in small talk as they wait for their train to arrive. If you were writing a story based on this stimulus, you could create a plot around this community taking a trip somewhere important. Or perhaps you could make your story character driven, writing about the growing relationship between these characters who just happen to be classmates or work colleagues. For more of a horror twist, if you're into that genre, you could write a story in which the narrator is a serial people watcher and has a creepy, eerie fascination with eavesdropping on random people's conversations. On the more symbolic side of things, you could also create a story around the train station itself as a, as a metaphor for our transitory states in life. Train stations are typically in between places. They are rarely anyone's destination. They are places that we pass through in order to get somewhere else. You could, in theory, have a story about a character whose life is currently in an in-between state. Perhaps your protagonist has just graduated from school and doesn't know what they're going to do with their lives. In that case, the appearance of a train station scene would be a, a motif, a symbol for the grander idea of us as individual beings who will pass through some stage um, on our way to another. Our third stimulus is a novel extract quote from Marguerite Dura, a French writer. The light fell from the sky in cataracts of pure transparency, in torrents of silence and immobility. The air was blue, you could hold it in your hand. 
blue. The sky was a continual throbbing of the brilliance of the light. Now, this final stimulus example from Marguerite Dura um, is what we're going to look at for our quote prompt. This particular text extract is from an autobiographical novel by Marguerite Dura. Just like our first visual stimulus of the dry creek bed, we can take the quote at face value and even continue the story from this vivid visual description of the sky. Perhaps the protagonist is exploring a rural setting for the first time after living in the city and is discovering the joys of letting go of previous expectations placed on her by family and society. And again, you can also think about the symbolic imagery within this extract. The repetitive mention of light and sky could become a continuing motif in a story about emotional or psychological freedom, or a story about a protagonist who's reaching for some sort of hope or optimism. The narrator in the quote seems to feel a sense of intense reverence and wonder. The imagery in the quote is full of paradoxes. There are cataracts of pure transparency and torrents of silence and immobility neither of which makes sense as literal images. You could pick up on these paradoxes and the narrator's feeling of awe in your work. Perhaps your story could be character-driven, an exploration of self and the realization of personal liberation after a relationship breakdown, for example. Paradoxically, your character's heartbreak might be something that brings her to a beautiful realization about her own strength. Another great example uh, for a motif that would, be, that would carry an underlying message would be symbolically interpreting the color blue from the extract. In color psychology, the color blue can represent being in a calm state. Blue can also represent intelligence and a darker hue of royal blue can even represent power. If you wanted to create a story that's a bit darker in tone, you could also use a murky blue as a recurring motif to signify depression and isolation in your main character. If you're looking for more tips and tricks for understanding stimuli, please check out the Matrix blog for creatively responding to a stimulus. So now that we've examined different ways to approach, interpret, and include different kinds of stimuli in our creative writing, let's have a look at what narrative elements we need to consider. Chapter three, understanding narrative elements. Understanding elements of the narrative process can cover aspects like plot, setting, form, characterization, the consideration of a motif, or an interwoven image or symbol that supports your story's underlying message. In saying that, narrative elements are still part of the planning stage of your story writing process. So let's break these elements down. Just a quick note before we begin. When we engage with narrative, um, we are essentially creating people and their worlds in our storytelling. In order to do so in an effective way that engages with your reader and makes them sympathize and empathize with you, your storytelling needs to achieve something called verisimilitude. Okay, that sounds like a big and complicated word, but verisimilitude simply refers to an authentic representation of reality. This means that in order for storytelling to be effective and well, not cringe, we have to think about realistic patterns of human behavior which is that every thought or action that takes place needs to be a believable reaction or response. We'll talk about verisimilitude and pertinent examples later on in this webinar in our chapter on mistakes to avoid. Narrative element number one, characterization. A lot of the time students can make the mistake of thinking that characterization stops at what your character looks like. If you've written something along the lines of, Mary was a 13 year old Caucasian girl with blonde hair and blue eyes, then this chapter is definitely for you. Now, considering characterization, before you put pen to paper, it's super important. And the first thing you need to ask yourself is, why should the reader care about my protagonist? This is an especially important question because the limited word count of flash fiction requires in-depth characterization in order to cement important themes and the underlying message of your story. These are the questions about your character that you need to consider. What are your character's main intentions with your story? Are they trying to get somewhere or trying to accomplish a task or any kind of personal growth? What are your character's general motivations and life goals? Are they trying to just get by in life? Or perhaps they're trying to exceed their family's expectations of success. What is your character's ethical or moral code that they would or would not compromise? If you're interested in a complex story about corrupt morals, check out Gabriel Garcia Marquez's flash fiction piece, One of These Days. What is your character's personality is another question. Are they shy? 
Are they outgoing? Are they maybe a mumbler? What are your character's aesthetic choices? As in, what kind of clothing do they wear? And what does their clothing say about their priorities in everyday life? Do they dress in bright, loud colors? Or perhaps you can always find your protagonist in loungewear and gym sweats. Your characters are people just like you. And like you, they need to be represented in storytelling with all the complexities and character flaws that we have as human beings, warts and all. Let's have a look at an example that engages with complex characterization. We'll start with a neutral base, so no connotations. Tim picked up the pen. Okay, from our simple tell and not show action, we are made aware of a basic action, but we don't know anything about the action of picking up a pen or anything about the person who is picking it up. So now let's take that simple action of Tim picking up a pen and make it a little bit more exciting. Tim reluctantly pulled the pen out of his rucksack. From this example, we know that whatever the pen will be used for is an activity that Tim isn't really keen on doing. That example did expand on the action, but still was a bit on the nose and not quite in depth enough to support a character driven story. Let's have a look at one final example of characterization. Tim slung his backpack over one shoulder and made a beeline for the coveted corner desk at his school library. He wanted to get the most out of his lunch break by doing the practice papers on electromagnetism that Mr. Bunting had spruced ahead of the physics midterm. Exam time was in full swing and Tim was feeling the jitters of unmet expectations. He usually sat in the 70s, but he needed at least an 85 to bring up his GPA. He pulled out his favorite pen, a wine dark stabilo which could almost pass as blue for exam purposes. No teacher had complained about his kaleidoscopic in choices yet, a fact which emboldened him to continue his collection of dark hued, green, orange and purple pens that were only one shade away from the stipulated black. This final example engages with the process of characterization in a much more in-depth way. Here, Tim is characterized as a complex individual with all his idiosyncrasies, that is, the habits and behaviors that are unique to a particular person. In this example, we know that Tim is a senior high school student who has recently decided to start studying super hard in order to get into university. We also know that Tim really likes stationery and is almost obsessed with his study equipment to the extent that his pens reflect his colorful and subtly rebellious personality. Our second narrative element, plot. In saying all this, having a character driven story doesn't mean that plot isn't important. Plot is still a very necessary narrative element that can make or break a story. Plot describes the overarching structure of a story, the things that happen and the sequence in which they are presented to the reader. When deciding what plot structure to use, we have to keep our word count in mind. Knowing that we only have 800 to 1000 words to play around with, we have to choose a plot that is simple to follow while still exploring complex characterization and a nuanced message. That means that our plot needs to say a lot with not very many words at all. The first question to ask yourself here is, are you going to use a linear or a nonlinear plot line? What does that mean? A linear plot line is one that goes from point A to point B and the entire sequence of events occurs in chronological order. On the other hand, nonlinear plot lines can be more complicated, but can also be very satisfying when the non chronological sequence of events tie together at the end. A plot structure that would add interest to a flash fiction piece would be a, would be a circular plot structure in which your story would end in a way that echoes how you began, perhaps with some image or event. A great example of a circular plot structure is James Thurber's short story, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. All right, our third narrative element, form. Another consideration that might fit into your decisions around plot is whether you'll decide to experiment with form. When we talk about textual form, that can sound a bit vague and too complicated to wrap our heads around. So let's break it down. The word comes from a Latin word which directly means shape, whereas the word textual here is an adjective that understands text to mean anything at all that weaves together or conveys meaning. If we put those words textual and form together, we can understand the term textual form to refer to the medium through which meaning is conveyed. When it comes to creative writing, this understanding of textual form can refer to the structure of your storytelling. Here, you should be asking yourself, in what way am I going to lay out my story? 
The following are several potential layouts for you to consider. A, the vignette. If I were to define vignettes in creative writing for you, it would simply be the capturing of a single moment or scene that sits within a larger story. Vignettes usually are characterized by vibrantly vivid descriptive episodes. For example, you might see a paragraph that describes a moment in time in which a character is eating dinner on their own. For this, for example, Michael wrestled a fork from the dish rack. His small but trusty dishwasher had finally given up after years of uncomfortably heavy wash cycles. He had set up his lean cuisine fettuccine alfredo on the kitchen counter and pierced the plastic film with a few well-meaning stabs before tossing his solitary dinner into the microwave. When the microwave stopped its final beep, Michael headed to the couch, put his feet up on the sagging ottoman and switched on the sports streaming service that housed his favourite cricket replays. As you can see, a vignette wouldn't necessarily contain an entire plot within its description, but it helps to contribute to the overarching message or purpose of your story. Essentially, I would encourage you to use vignettes within your story if you're looking to zoom in or on your character or your setting. Our next element of textual form, the frame narrative. A frame narrative is a story that sits within or more commonly before the beginning of the main story, which sets the stage for a slightly more complex story and helps the reader to be more connected with distinct realities of the protagonist and our perspectives of the protagonist. A great example of the frame story can be found in this opening extract from Colombian author Gabriel Garcia Marquez's novel Of Love and Other Demons, a magical realist tale that serves as a critique of Spanish colonialism and the oppressive superstitions of Catholicism along the Caribbean coastline of the 18th century. Let's take a look. October 26, 1949 was not a day filled with important news. Maestro Clemente Manuel Zavala, editor-in-chief of the newspaper where I learned the essentials of being a reporter, concluded our morning meeting with two or three routine suggestions. He did not assign a specific story to any writer. A few minutes later, he was informed by telephone that the burial crypts of the old convent of Santa Clara were being emptied. And with few illusions, he said to me, stop by there and see if you can come up with anything. The surprise lay in the third niche of the high altar, on the side where the gospels were kept. The stone shattered at the first blow of the pickaxe and a stream of living hair, the intense color of copper, spilled out of the crypt. The foreman, with the help of the laborers, attempted to uncover all the hair and the more of it they brought out, the longer and more abundant it seemed, until at last the final strands appeared still attached to the skull of a young girl. The impassive foreman explained that human hair grew a centimeter a month after death and 22 meters seemed a good average for 200 years. I, on the other hand, did not think it so trivial a matter for when I was a boy, my grandmother had told me the legend of a little 12 year old Marquise with hair that trailed behind her like a bridal train who had died of rabies caused by a dog bite and was venerated in the towns along the Caribbean coast for the many miracles she had performed. This is Gabriel Garcia Marquez from his novel of Love and Other Demons. This short opening chapter is a fictive frame story to set the reader up to travel back in time to the colonial times of Cartagena, Colombia, to be immersed in the story of the little 12-year-old Marquise. Much like nested stories, frame stories are an effective narrative plot structure to introduce multiple perspectives in a succinct and engaging way. Now onto epistolary form. Now moving on to our final exploration of different types of narrative form, the epistolary form is essentially just a really fancy way of saying storytelling that is told through a series of letters. This letter storytelling can also be done through a series of diary entries as well. The great thing about using a letter format to reveal plot and setting is that your reader can get a really great understanding of your protagonist's internal emotions, psyche and personality through the story that's being told through an intimate format. A lot of really famous novels are in the epistolary form, including Bram Stoker's Dracula and Anne Bronte's The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Another classical novel written in this letter form is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and I've included an extract from earlier on in the novel. Archangel 28th, March 17. To Mrs. Saville, England. How slowly the time passes here, encompassed as I am by frost and snow. Yet a second step is taken towards my enterprise. I have hired a vessel and am occupied in collecting my sailors. Those whom I have already engaged appear to be men on whom I can depend and are certainly possessed of dauntless courage.
Mary Shirley's novel Frankenstein is extremely well known for the scary monster that is created out of Dr. Frankenstein's experimentation with creating life from an inanimate corpse. As readers, we are slowly introduced into this science fiction slash horror novel through the eyes of the explorer Robert Walton, who hears Dr. Frankenstein's story and then writes back to his sister Margaret with the extraordinary tale. Much like the previous narrative forms that we've discussed, the epistolary form is also a great way to get some important inner thoughts and emotions from your characters while also being able to play around with perspective. Now onto our next element, Setting is another narrative element we need to consider. This is super important to consider in the planning stages of any creative writing story. Setting within short stories and especially flash fiction needn't be too complex, but it does need to be specific enough to support your characterization process. For example, where and when your protagonist was born and lives will impact the character's personal values, motivations, and their general outlook on life. With deciding your story setting, you need to figure out the where, which is your physical setting, and the when, which is what we call the temporal setting. Will your story be historical fiction? Or perhaps your story will take place in the imagined dystopian future as part of the science fiction genre. Going back to the point I previously mentioned about very similitude, another aspect of creating an immersive setting is to ensure a strong world building process. World building is a narrative process that is especially important for creative writing as it refers to the fictional construction of a world that is different to our own reality. Now, just because your story takes place within a fantastical setting doesn't mean that you can be vague about you know, what the world is like in terms of its history, politics, geography, and natural environment. Especially when writing fantasy or dystopian fiction, it is incredibly important to ensure that your fictional world is an authentic representation of reality. That is, it has to be very similitudinous. An example of ensuring very similitude in our fictional settings and world building processes is actually the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, where JK Rowling has created a magical world that still has rules of power. The Wizarding World has its own government, the Ministry of Magic, just like our own reality. And wand users also have to abide by strict rules when using magic, an aspect of world building that echoes our society's laws about dangerous weapons like guns and knives. If you're looking to get inspired by creating an authentic representation of magic and fantasy in your writing, check out Oscar Wilde's short story, The Fisherman and His Soul. On to the next narrative element, the motif. A final narrative element to think about including in your creative writing stories is the motif. Matrix education defines a motif as image, sound, figure, a character or a character archetype or an object which has a symbolic reference to a particular theme or idea. A motif is a recurring symbol with a figurative meaning and is quite easy to spot due to its prominence. As a side note, you can find Matrix literary techniques toolkit on our website. Including a motif in your creative writing story plan will elevate the purpose and underlying message of your piece. When deciding on a motif to symbolize or represent the argument of your story, first ask yourself, why should we care about your story and the characters within it? And what message is your story sending to your reader? Some examples of a motif can include a recurring object, person, or even color. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of motifs within a story. For an object, let's have a look at the motif of the titular pigeon in Patrick Suskin's novella, The Pigeon. Suskin's novella tells the tale of the most horrifying day that his middle-aged protagonist, Jonathan Noel, has ever experienced. Living in Paris, but originally from a town in rural France, Jonathan has suffered from tragic blows in his life. He is yet to articulate or emotionally deal with the traumas of fighting in the war or of his life, wife and son leaving him for another man. Instead, he maintains a very comfortable but incredibly dull life as a bank security guard. It's quite possible that no one else in Paris has spent quite so many years standing in the exact same spot as him. The titular pigeon is an unassuming creature that shows up outside Noel's quiet studio unit. Noel goes into a craze because of this pigeon to the point where he refuses to leave his room for fear of this winged creature. He's so afraid of this pigeon that he believes he might die the next day from fright. As the reader, we all know that there's nothing scary about this pigeon. But if we step into the shoes of the protagonist, Jonathan, we can absolutely empathize with his senseless reaction towards the bird. 
knowing that the pigeon is a recurring motif that kicks off Jonathan's wild fear, it is possible for us to interpret the underlying message of Suskin's novella to be a critique of the banality and mundaneness of everyday life. The pigeon, on the other hand, unassuming and tiny in size and significance, may be interpreted as the fear and trauma that is deeply buried within Jonathan. And in this way, the pigeon kickstarts Suskin's protagonist into action and reaction. Now, for a recurring person as a motif within a story, let's unpack the character of the eponymous Miriam in Truman Capote's really famous short story entitled Miriam. A psychological thriller, the short story Miriam covers a few life-changing days in the life of a 61-year-old widower named Mrs. H.T. Miller. Mrs. Miller is an unassuming woman living alone in New York City. She's someone who has the same daily routine, eats the same meals every day and never tries anything new. On her evening trip to the cinema, Mrs. Miller encounters a precocious young girl of around 10 or 11 on her own. She goes by the name of Miriam, which is coincidentally Mrs. Miller's first name too. As the snow falls, Miriam pesters Mrs. Miller more and more, eventually showing up at Mrs. Miller's doorstep and refusing to leave. Miriam smashes Mrs. Miller's vase out of fury and steals a cameo given to her by her husband. Over the next few days, Mrs. Miller begins feeling an inexplicable change in herself and her habits. She finds herself buying fruits and sweets she would never have gone out of her way to do before, cherries and almond cakes. A short time later, the young girl Miriam barges into her apartment once again and declares that she's moving in all of a sudden. Distraught to not knowing who to turn to, Mrs. Miller calls on her neighbors to help, but they investigate and find that there are no signs of anyone actually being in her apartment. How strange. Mrs. Miller then starts to wonder if she has imagined encountering the little girl Miriam all this time. Finally, the story ends with Mrs. Miller being woken by the faint rustling sound of a little girl's dress and the eerie interruption of young Miriam's hello. Creepy, isn't it? If I were to tell you that the little girl Miriam is a recurring motif in the story that symbolizes an idea, concept, or reality that is deeper than what we see on the surface, what do you think the character of young Miriam would represent? Author Truman Capote has revealed that this story is a psychological thriller about discovering deep aspects of our own minds and emotions that we never thought we had. The character of the older Miriam um, Miller starts hallucinating the appearance of the young Miriam. The little girl doesn't actually exist and it's a figment of Mrs. Miller's imagination. In this way, the hallucination of the young girl, also called Miriam, then becomes a motif about a wild, chaotic, and ultimately repressed side of Mrs. Miller that she was never got to experience in the past. In discussing the use of color as a motif, let's break down the use of red in Angela Carter's short story, The Bloody Chamber. One final example of a type of motif I wanted to discuss with you guys is the use of color as a recurring symbol in storytelling. Angela Carter's short story, The Bloody Chamber, can be seen as a contemporary retelling or appropriation of the French folktale Bluebeard that was originally popularized by Charles Perrault's retelling in 1697. Quite old, but this is contemporary retelling. The original tale tells of a frightening man who, despite his wealth and noble status, has a beard so blue that it frightened all young women from marrying him. That, and the fact that all his previous wives are coincidentally nowhere to be found. Eventually, the youngest daughter of a local family agrees to marry him. At first, she enjoys her luxurious new life until her husband has to go away on a business trip. Before he leaves, Bluebeard gives the protagonist a huge set of keys. These keys happen to unlock every single door in their vast household, which she's welcome to explore. But... He strictly warns her not to use one little iron key that opens the smallest, dingiest door in their house. Bluebeard leaves for a couple of days, and despite having invited her sisters and mothers over to stay, curiosity gets the better of the protagonist, and she enters the dingy looking room with the forbidden iron key. She opens the door and finds the entire room covered floor to ceiling in blood. The blood and corpses of all Bluebeard's previous missing wives. In a fright, the protagonist drops the key on the bloody floor, and however much he tries to clean the key, the red, bloody spots refuse to come out. Bluebeard returns soon and demands his keys back, but when he realizes that the iron key has blood on it, he realizes that she has disobeyed him and promises to kill her on the spot. Begging him for 15 minutes to say her prayers, she sends for her brother, who at the last minute arrives to kill Bluebeard before he murders their younger sister.
apart from Bluebeard, they all live happy, happily ever after. Angela Carter's version of Bluebeard goes much the same way, except that it's actually her mother who comes with a rifle to rescue her at the end instead of her brothers. The story itself is entitled The Bloody Chamber, and the recurring motif of the colour red, alongside the constant mentions of blood, speaks to the visceral themes of the loss of innocence coupled with the sadistic nature of gendered violence. Even though quite stark, the figurative bombardment of sanguine red in the colours that the protagonist wears, in the flush of her cheeks, and of course, in the eponymous bloody chamber itself. Moving on to chapter four, language skills and written expression. Now that we've done a deep dive into the elements of the narrative, we're gonna move on to another extremely important consideration of the fictional writing process, language. It can be extremely easy when planning your characterization, plot and setting to figure about what kind of language you're going to use and how you're going to express yourself. In this chapter about language skills and written expression, I'm going to be chatting about tone, modality, vocabulary, distinct approaches to dialogue, syntax and grammar, and potentially some language mistakes to avoid. The first part, tone. Without discussion about language, I want to encourage you guys to have a think about how language and especially tone and vocabulary will highly impact the characterization of your protagonists and the setting of your fictional world. First up, tone otherwise known as register. Tone can most easily be understood as the attitude or feeling that you are trying to communicate with the audience. Your reader should be able to scan through your work and pick up on the emotions that you have tried to convey, be it optimistic, gloomy, uncertain, or perhaps your story has a frenetic kind of energy to it. The tone that you convey might be tied up in the genre, a horror story, for example, you might want to create an anxious atmosphere that heightens to a jump scare at the end. Now, the first thing to keep in mind when setting a particular tone for your story is that language holds power, and more specifically, that words carry either positive or negative connotations. What do I mean by connotation? Connotation refers to how single words or phrases can associate non-literal ideas or feelings to their literal meaning. For example, the word velvet, apart from describing the color purple and also being the name of a soft type of woven fabric, has connotations or associations of wealth, privilege, regalness, and luxury. For an example of a negative connotation, the word weasel, while describing a rather cute animal in my opinion, actually has not so great connotations of evilness, deception, cowardice, and even laziness. Before we move on to decisions around vocabulary, let's look at two storytelling sentences with vastly distinct tones. Just like before with our characterization example, we'll start with a neutral sentence. Sam got a dog. Now, let's look at that sentence through a positive connotation. Even though the dog hammock might have been a little overkill, Sam couldn't help but stare giddily at her new companion sleeping soundly within the lofty fabric. Milo was a six-year-old mastiff with quizzical ears that only drooped when his snoring began. And finally, through the negative connotation. It was coming up to the two-week mark now, but Sam still couldn't get a hold of the yapping. And when she wasn't barking at that god-awful pitch, she was wheezing. Her new pug Penny had a nose so scrunched that, when, that she constantly wheezed droplets of spittle onto the carpet. As you can see, whatever tone that you establish in your story can drastically change your characters, your setting, and even your plot. And moving on to our next point of vocabulary, you can also probably see that the word choice greatly impacts the message and, emotion, and emotions that you aim to communicate with your reader. So on vocabulary, the first thing is that we have high and low modality language. In setting a certain tone for your story, another consideration you might have is what modality you'll be writing in, high or low. High modality language is characterized by a more intense and heightened use of wording, specifically around tense and the grammatical mood. That sounds a little complicated, so let me explain. High modality language will include tenses and grammatical moods that indicate a higher degree of certainty, as opposed to the ambiguity and uncertainty of low modality language. High modality conveys a sense of the definite and the urgent, whereas low modality conveys stuff that can be left on the back burner. It's a modality that, that's more laid back and, and chill. High modality uses future tense, words like will. For example, Maria will stay at home today to avoid missing her package delivery. 
On the other end of the spectrum, low modality can use conditional mood, words like would and could. Maria could have gone to the office today, but instead stayed at home to collect her package from the postman. Other words and expressions that express either low or high modality are the following. For low modality, we have may, might, probably, possibly, could, would. And for high modality, we have definitely, extremely, can, and will. On to our next point, jargon. Another aspect of vocabulary usage that might pique your interest is jargon. Jargon sounds like a, well, jargony word. So what does it mean? I like to define jargon as words that are used in a particular activity or field of study. These words are so specific to an activity or field of study that most people wouldn't be able to understand what they mean. I want you guys to take a second to think about an extracurricular activity or hobby that you do. Are there any words that a non-participant wouldn't quite understand? For example, if you play tennis, what does the word love mean? If you play NRL, what the heck is a scrum? If you find yourself writing a story about a doctor, it would really help create a realistic setting and character by researching some words that would fit well into your story. Perhaps your doctor is a general practitioner, you know, a GP, who sees a lot of patients, and so you will need to realistically describe the process of recording blood pressure and other medical equipment. Take a look at the brief paragraph below. Dr. Saha's office was right next to pathology, meaning that there was always one patient toting a specimen carry bag with a fluorescent yellow collection cup inside who rocked up to his room despite his clearly placed name placard. Pathology is next door, Dr. Saha would say while sticking a tongue depressor in the mouth of his tonsillitis patient. Can you spot all the jargon words? They were pathology, specimen carrier bag, tongue depressor and tonsillitis. As you can see, it doesn't have to be too complicated or overly difficult to do some research into appropriate and engaging terminology to create an authentic representation of a scene in your story, bringing us back to verisimilitude. Okay, our next element, multilingualism. Um, so furthermore, when we have discussions about vocabulary, I also don't want any of you guys to think that you're limited to writing solely in an English-based understanding of language. Australia as a country is becoming increasingly diverse in terms of our multicultural and multilingual communities. And that diversity is something that can also be reflected in our literature. If you're writing a story which has a significant cultural aspect, don't be afraid to include vocabulary in a different language. As long as the use of multilingualism, multilingualism contributes to some element of your narrative, for example, your characterization, your plot or setting, and you're providing transliterations and English translations of your multilingual vocabulary, then you're all set. Let's take a quick look at an excellent example of incorporating multilingualism from the Growing Up in Australia anthology. This particular short uh, narrative memoir is written by Aditi Guverno. Okay, so in Tamil, my father's native tongue, there is a word, Jalra, which means shadow. From that day on, Waylee became my Jalra. That Saturday, Waylee stood on my doorstep and rang the bell twice. My mother was cooking and the house smelt of mixed spices. Cumin, chili powder and garam masala floated through the air like a scented rainbow. My mother opened the door and called out my name with a smile on her face. I saw Waylee standing there. A second later, as he entered my house, I saw everything Indian come to the foreground as if lit by a spotlight. The wooden statue of Ganesh, the fabric birds, birds hanging on a string, my father lounging around in a dhoti, a dhoti governor. This story is called Wei Li and Me in Growing Up Asian in Australia, edited by Alice Pung. Okay, the next element, dialogue in language. And onto the next important element of improving our language skills for creative writing, let's talk about all things dialogue. Dialogue can be a really difficult element to practice and master, and it's really common to find any dialogue that you do end up including in your story to be chunky and unrealistic. Let's go back again to the word that I previously mentioned, very similitude, which means to make sure that you're creating an authentic representation of reality. Dialogue forms a huge part of representing authentically realistic and not cringe expressions of direct speech in your creative writing. It can be so tempting to write out an entire story with back and forth dialogue, but when including dialogue, make sure that there is a variation between your direct speech and your reported speech. 
A great way to do this is to be specifically descriptive about the ways in which something has been said. Describing the body language of your protagonist when they're saying something is a really effective way of making sure that both your direct dialogue and indirect storytelling play an important role in your narrative. Let's look at the following example where just as much is being conveyed within the dialogue as outside the dialogue. Mum asked me to make a quick trip down to the Miracle supermarket. She was making wonton soup for our weekend family lunch and we just happened to be out of silky dumpling skins. It's only when I'm standing at the checkout with two packets of pre-made wonton wrappers that I notice my cashier is she auntie. I curse at myself. I was so sure that she auntie had Saturdays off. Otherwise, I would have made my little brother go instead of me. Hi auntie, how are you? I acquiesce to her knowing smile. She wasn't related to me. We just call older people in our community auntie and uncle. You look tired today. More bags under your eyes than usual. I have a good concealer you can borrow. I'll pass it on to your mum next week. As usual, no hello or how are you, just a good dose of criticism. I smile in response and hope that it doesn't come off as a grimace. That's very kind of you, auntie, but I don't wear makeup. You should, she gives a derisive nod. Otherwise, how will you ever get a boyfriend? Another thing to keep in mind while writing dialogue is that while we're aiming for the representation of speech, that doesn't mean that directly copying what human speech sounds like. What I mean by that is we should try to avoid using filler words like um and ah and uh that we might hear in our day-to-day -day lives. We have to be really quick and sharp with our dialogue when writing. Another thing to keep in mind is that once you establish a speaking pattern for your characters, you then need to maintain those speech patterns. If your protagonist speaks colloquially, informally, or with lots of jargon, for example, that's not something that you can suddenly drop with no context. Maintaining a spoken register is just as important as creating it in the first place. So now that we've got a better idea of how to effectively integrate dialogue, let's talk about some distinct types of written expression that can help us to create realistically complex three-dimensional characters. Okay, so the first part is colloquialisms. The next, the next aspect of vocabulary seems like it sits on the opposite side of the formal versus informal spectrum. Including colloquial language in your imaginative writing can be really fun and it can be really effective um, in order to add flavor to the tone and style of your character's way of speaking. Including colloquial language, which is conversational language that is informal and unconstrained, allows us to bend the rules of grammar to create a more believable sense of voice and characterization. There are many types of, of colloquialisms, including popular sayings like the cat's out of the bag and something being a piece of cake. Colloquial language can also include vernacular language, which is just a fancy way of saying the dialect of a particular region or community. Australia in particular has a very strong colloquial culture with words like arvo for afternoon, bludger for someone who avoids work and budgie smugglers for a comedically distinct type of swimwear. Let's take a look at an extract from Australian author Marcus Zusak's novel, The Messenger. The police are outside, but they have no idea what's happening in the bank. Word hasn't made it to the street yet. They're telling someone in a gold Tirana to, to stop double parking outside the bakery across the road. The car moves on and so do the cops, and the useless gunman is left holding the bag of money. His ride's gone. Marcus Zusak, The Messenger. You could probably tell that there's something incredibly Australian about this extract. In this case, it all comes down to the colloquial nature of this vocabulary. Okay, regionalisms. Regionalisms is something that's very similar to colloquial language, but it's slightly more specific in terms of geography. To situate your reader in a very nuanced idea of place. In Australia, for example, there's a debate between New South Welshmen and Victorians over whether the popular canteen food is called a potato scallop or a potato cake. Let's take a look at a creative piece that situates us in an urban primary school. Devon nervously waited in line at the tuck shop counter. He had $2.40, a combination of $2 worth of chores and the 40 cents that he saved from last week. The coins were warm by the time he reached the lady with a striped apron and an intimidating hairnet. What'll it be, love? The lady crooned. Two potato cakes, please, was Devon's timid response. 
I don't know what you're on about. We've just got hash browns, potato smileys, and a bag of hot chips left. Devin was confused. He leaned over and pointed at the potato cakes in the hot food display. They looked a bit wilted, but he had his heart set on the potato cakes. Potato scallops, you mean, love? The lady nodded, handing over the processed potato with a crusty set of tongs. As you can probably tell, Devon has probably moved schools to a new state, which explains why he's so nervous and doesn't quite have the lingo down. Okay, our next element of language, grammar and syntax. With grammar and syntax, you can start becoming more aware of parts in speech and your written tendencies. So, in this final section on how we can all be more intentional with our language in order to improve our written expression uh, for writing creatively, let's discuss grammar and syntax. We can all improve just by simply being conscious about our parts of speech and our written tendencies when it comes to correct grammar and sentence structure. The way that a sentence is organized can very much change what I like to call the vibe of what you're saying. For example, the word order of I must see this versus this I must see changes the urgency of the moment. This I must see has connotations of sarcasm with the way that we use language in contemporary English. For example, I swear I finished all my homework, mum, Jimmy promises. His mother is less than believing. Now this I must see. Active versus passive speech. Now, if you're a student who wants to be more intentional about your written expression, first ask yourself, have I ever thought about my use of active versus passive voice? If you answered no here, let me explain. The most basic sentence structure requires two things, a subject and a predicate. A subject is the person or thing that is acting in a sentence. The predicate is the part of the sentence that tells us what the subject is doing. The absolute most basic sentence can be, Sarah drinks. Sarah here is the subject and the predicate here is drinks, the verb. Now, what happens if we complicate that sentence to Sarah drinks water? We now end up with Sarah as the subject of the sentence, drinks as the verb, and water as the object. In grammar, object refers to the part of the sentence to which something is being done, in this case, the water. The sentence of Sarah drinks water is in the active construction. It's clear, straightforward, and to the point. If we were to change the sentence into the passive construction, it would look like this. Water is being drunk by Sarah. Here, the focus has shifted to the object of the sentence, which is water. As you can see, consciously using the active voice will help your writing become clearer. And if you do use the passive voice, make sure that you have a reason for doing it. For example, a type of emphasis or a certain type of mood that you're going for. Have you seen Sarah at all today? Queried their maths teacher. Stella piped up to explain the notable absence. Sarah was picked up by her parents during last period. I think she wasn't feeling too well. So here, Sarah is the focus. Next, the genitive case, otherwise known as the possessive case. Okay, let's move on to another way of getting a better grasp on grammar. Let's talk about nouns of possession. Nouns, as most of you know, are the people, places, or things within any given sentence. But did you know that there are so many different types and functions of nouns? They're not only the subjects and objects of sentences. There's actually another use of nouns, nouns that display possession. A grammatical error that teachers often see is the incorrect use of nouns that denote possession, especially with the placement of the apostrophe. In terms of getting a better understanding of the possessive noun, there are two things that I hope you guys take away from the section. The first is the correct apostrophe placement of possessive nouns. The general rule is that singular nouns show possession with the apostrophe before the S. So here we've got Sarah's book. Secondly, plural nouns show possession with the apostrophe taking place after the S. The books, apostrophe, titles were all of distinct genres. The tricky one to note is the possessive for the word its. Its with no apostrophe shows possession, for example, its mother. Whereas its with the apostrophe refers to the contraction of it is. So don't make that mistake. You can find the specifics of this grammar rule and much more in the English grammar toolkit that you can find on the Matrix blog. Tying into our goal as students and writers who are able to say a lot with as few words as possible, the second aspect of understanding the intricacies of the possessive noun is how we can effectively apply this to our creative writing. Which, in your opinion, is more effective to you? The books of Sarah or Sarah's books? <laughs>
Both of these sentences mean the same thing and the emphasis in both changes according to what you want to bring into focus. Either the person Sarah or the books in question. Okay, next, verbal and pronoun fronting. The final point of improving our language expression is the syntactical idea of verbal and pronoun fronting. fronting. Syntax meaning sentence order. When we say fronting, we are simply referring to what part of speech we are intentionally placing as the first word of any given sentence. Having pronouns like I, me, or my at the front of a series of sentences helps to focus your reader on showing the inner psychological or emotional state of any given character. Madeline Miller, Madeline Miller has a novel called Circe, and she does a great job at repeating the stylistic feature of fronting. Have a look at the following extract. At last, when there was nothing else to clean, I, saw, I, I sat before the half ash. I was not shaking anymore. I did not move at all. My flesh seemed to have congealed around me. My skin stretched, stretched over it like a dead thing, rubbery and vile. We can see that in these successive sentences, the protagonist has most likely gone through a traumatic ordeal. And as the reader, the pronoun fronting of the repeated eyes and mys help to establish the protagonist's agonizing emotional state. Verbal fronting, on the other hand, is when verbs are placed at the front of the sentence. If these verbs are commands or orders, then verbal fronting packs a real literary punch. And with that, we'll wrap up chapter four on language skills and written expression. If you're looking to get any further tips on some of the more common student grammar mistakes, you can find helpful grammar tips on the Matrix Education blog. Okay, under chapter five, our, one of our final chapters, mistakes to avoid. So for chapter five, we'll be unpacking a few of the most common mistakes that your teachers might find in your creative writing. First, back to our point about verisimilitude. It's time for a quick reminder about the importance of verisimilitude. While it's not important to remember this complex jargony word, it's important to remember that our creative writing should engage with genuine representations of reality. This reality doesn't mean that you can't write a short story in the fantasy genre, for example, but it does mean that your characterization, setting and plot doesn't have any holes and reflects authentic actions and reactions. To demonstrate what I mean by this authentic representation of reality, Let's take a look at an example of what not to do. Billy was a 13 year old boy with bright blue hair and hazel eyes. He was walking through the market at midnight and was a little upset to notice all of the food trucks closing for the night. As he walked through the streets in the central part of town, he suddenly stumbled across a dark alleyway. He sauntered down the alleyway that did not have a single person in sight. Billy stopped when he saw an antique store that he had never heard of or seen before and decided to go in. There seemed to be no one at the store counter, so he perused the dazzling objects scattered around until he came across a gold watch. The clock struck midnight when he happened to touch the watch. To his surprise, it lit up in a magical glow. The watch has chosen you, boomed a voice from behind the store counter. With great power comes great responsibility, the disembodied voice said. Okay, reminder, that is what not to do in your creative writing. First of all, the main issue with this fantasy genre creative extract is just how unbelievable it is. And it's not the magical watch that's unbelievable. It's everything about Billy that makes this story, well, cringe. While Billy has been given a description, we know his age, a little bit about what he looks like, this description does nothing whatsoever in contributing to the deeper aspects of Billy's character. What are Billy's intentions, motivations, personal goals, personality, aesthetic choices, likes and dislikes? What on earth would possess Billy to be walking around in the middle of the city with no one around for no reason whatsoever? Then why on earth would Billy randomly spot a dark alleyway and then decide to go down it? What are the reasons for having a mysteriously placed antique store? And why does Billy decide to go in? We should then ask ourselves why Billy would touch everything until he came across the golden watch. And finally, the paragraph ends on the excruciating cliche, uh, with great power comes great responsibility, which I'm sure is an expression that most of your teachers would veto from the get-go. As we deepen our writing skills over the course of our high school studies, we start to show and not tell more effectively. So let's look a little bit about how we can approach creative descriptions effectively. Okay, so showing and not telling. Most of you guys have probably heard your English teachers say at one point or another that it's important to show and not tell. 
Now, that's all well and good, but what does that actually mean? What does showing and not telling actually look like? Showing and not telling in your creative writing is about making sure that every description that you include contributes to at least some element of your story, whether that be characterization, setting, or plot. You can refer to the characterization setting in chapter three, where we looked at examples on how to describe your characters without being too on the nose. Showing and telling is a helpful reminder that it's not enough to just describe for the sake of describing. For example, it might be tempting to write something along the lines of, the sun shone down brightly on the tumultuous crowds below. Showing and telling is about using the base of this description and constructing a story within the language. So taking that sentence above, let's see if we can turn it into a description that actually contributes to the narrative. Alex knew that this three day country music festival was going to be a bad idea. He had never particularly enjoyed country western music and even though his best friend adored Dolly Parton, Alex still cringed inwardly at the twang of a steel string guitar. It was now two days into this three day journey and he was as infernal as ever, quite literally. The sun refused to let up and Alex seemed to be the only one in the crowd of Tim McGraw fanatics who was exceedingly bothered by the dry summer heat. His $8 water bottle only added insult to injury. As you can see, showing and not telling is all about situating your reader in a visceral way through your direct and specific construction of language. Okay, next point. Think big, but are you thinking too big? One of the main issues with high school students who are trying to get a feel for creative writing is that while we encourage students to think big and to think outside the box and come up with something original, there's also the danger of having a story that's way too large in scope. Have you ever written a short story only to have your reader or your teacher say that the plot reads like a novel? If you answered yes to that, then here are some tips you can think about in honing in your storytelling to have a clear yet succinct message or overarching meaning. Basically, if creative writing in high school is a television series, try to treat any narrative submission as an episode in a series or a scene in a film rather than an entire blockbuster film. That's not to say that your story shouldn't have a beginning, middle and end, just that your beginning, middle and end needs to be smaller in scope to account for the decreased word count in comparison to a novel. To hone in on a more specific scope, first try to figure out what specific message or meaning you're trying to convey. For example, you might want to explore parent-child relationships instead of making a general feature length plot of the entire course of a familial relationship. There are still ways to get the same message across in 800 to 1200 words. You could potentially have an episodic structure that condenses the timeline of a larger plot into bite-sized focused events with each successive paragraph. Focus on one event that is a symbolic representation of your message or story. For a great example of a flash fiction story that has an extended period of time that is laid out episodically, and through the paragraphs, check out Margaret Atwood's speculative fiction about climate change called Time Capsule Found on a Dead Planet. One of the very final pieces of advice that I'll leave you guys with is a short discussion on how we can avoid cliches. Cliches are very common and are extremely derivative. They detract from the originality of your work. Going back to what we have been talking about this entire time, in improving our creative writing at the high school stage, most of what we learn is how to make our writing less cringe. I know I have personally read back my work and have been extremely embarrassed by my past work. There are certain ideas and phrases that you can try to avoid to avoid being cliched in your storytelling and written expression. Some ideas to avoid to avoid being cliched. Some ideas that we discourage you from basing your stories on include stories about drug addiction and severe mental illness. While, mil while mental illness is indeed an important theme that should definitely be an open conversation, the danger is that creative writing that is drawn from pop culture and not from your specific experience can end up being a misrepresentation of mental health, which helps no one, not even your own story. Try to also avoid having stories that have schizophrenic hallucinations or disturbing scenes of overdose. If you are committed to writing about mental illness, try to draw from your lived experience that you can authentically relate to, especially as creative writing should have a strong relationship with realistic actions and reactions.
Be careful also when writing about death and grief for the same reasons as previously mentioned. If this is something that you've gone through or something that someone you know or someone who's close to you has gone through, then that's completely fine. But if you're trying to romanticize grief, that actually takes away from the genuine experience of storytelling. Some phrases to avoid. When talking about phrases to avoid, my first and foremost piece of advice is to exclude all visceral descriptions of sweat. We do not like to see it. Try to avoid beads of sweat rolling down my face, droplets of sweat began to appear on my forehead, and of course, the very classic, my palms were dripping with sweat. And that brings us to the conclusion of this creative writing webinar. If you're looking for further and creative writing resources, um, we've now talked about a range of specific tips to help you improve your approach to creative writing and we've reached our conclusion. The first tip that we would tell you guys moving on from this webinar is you need to develop a reading habit. Now, you guys probably all have guessed that I am going to rehash the very thing all your English teachers would have said to you in the past. You need to get better at writing and by doing that, you need to get better at reading. This is the obligatory part where I will encourage all of you to at least try to pick up a reading habit. I think that there is a misconception that we're expecting you to read and enjoy the classics, but that's just not the case. It would be great for you to read what you're interested in. And if you're strapped for time, there's nothing wrong with just reading some short stories instead of a novel. Once more, I'm directing you to our ultimate short story reading guide that you can find on the Matrix blog. There are also apps online that can help you develop a reading habit, including social media reading communities like Storygraph that keep track of your story reading process and can even help you establish reading challenges. And what, what I've spent this whole time sharing with you all is an insight to what we teach in our face-to-face -face and online classes here at Matrix Education. With campuses across Greater Sydney, we run classes during the term and in the holidays to help our students improve their English skills. Most importantly, here at Matrix Education, we work to help students develop a love for learning. I hope that you found all these tips helpful and encouraging, and don't forget that there's no right answer to creative writing. Don't forget also to check out the supplementary links in the description box below, and maybe I'll even see you in one of my English classes. Bye for now. Thank you for attending this Matrix Expert webinar. We hope you apply our advice to improve your study practice. For more detailed content like this, click the link above to visit the Matrix Education blog and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. See you soon.